Having finished our exploration of radical grace in Paul's letter to the Galatians, I'd now like to tidy things up a bit. Paul relies on the account of Abraham to explain the salvation plan of God and how God's promise to Abraham to make him a blessing begins with the covenant relationship between God and Israel and through Christ with the rest of the world. Several weeks ago, I began this series with a bit of a prelude to the letter, with the institution of the covenant between God and Abram from Genesis 17. Although this is not the beginning of Abraham's story, it is an important, perhaps the most important part of his story. Throughout their many encounters and over many years, God has made a series of promises to Abraham, including the establishment of a new nation, a promised land, and a multitude of descendants. But it's not until chapter 17 and the institution of the covenant that the details become clear. Before the institution of the uh, Before this institution and the revelation of all the details, Abram was promised to be blessed with offspring. But when God first makes his promise, Abram has no children. He and his wife, Sarai, are in their 70s and 80s and considered barren. And many years later, after waiting for the Lord to fulfill the promise, they decide that maybe God needed a little help. We're now going to turn to Genesis chapter 16, which is prior to the establishment of God's covenant with Abram in 17. But it's after God's initial promise in the earlier chapters to give him descendants. And as we'll read we'll encounter a people and a culture and a time different from our own. So be careful with where you find blame or fault. In fact, you might be surprised just how or even if the narrator judges the actions of those involved and even more surprised at the judgment of the Lord. I'm reading now from Genesis chapter 16, beginning with the first verse. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong be done to me be on you. I gave my slave to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? 
She said, I am running away from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for the multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael. For the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild ass of a man. And with his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall live at odds with all his kin. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, You are El Roy. For she said, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Bear Lahai Rahoi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him, Ishmael. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Abram has been promised to become the father of many nations, that his offspring would become as many as the stars in the heavens. Yet after many years, he and his wife remain childless. Abram's wife, Sarai, says, Look, the Lord is preventing me from bearing you a child. Let's go about this a different way. Take my Egyptian slave, make her your wife, and her child will become our child. Again, it's a different time, a different culture. There's no judgment pronounced on Sarai's action. There's no determination that this is improper or scandalous. God doesn't punish them because of their lack of faith, lack of patience or the giving and taking of the servant into marriage. We are left on our own to determine, or if where there might be a problem. Some of us can imagine better than others the pain and anxiety related with infertility. To want something as meaningful and as special as a child, but to not have that longing fulfilled. On top of that, for your husband to have been promised by God to become the ancestor of a multitude of descendants. None of us can imagine that inner struggle Sarai experiences. And she blames herself, and she blames God. And who among us here can blame her? She makes this suggestion to her husband, who readily agrees, and her plan works. The once servant, now wife, becomes pregnant. And with the change of status comes a change in the dynamic between them all. Contempt, jealousy, conceit, disdain, abuse. What exactly happened between Hagar and Sarai and Sarai and Hagar? It's not clear. But the Hebrew word used for the treatment that Sarai deals with her Egyptian servant, Hagar, is the same word used later in Exodus on how the Egyptians deal with the enslaved Israelites. The mother of the slaves freed from Egypt, oppresses her Egyptian slave. But I'd like to focus mostly this morning on that slave, Hagar, and her encounter with the Lord in the wilderness, cast off from her master, pushed away from her husband, 
clinging to whatever self-dignity she can collect, she runs away. Perhaps as she sees it to save her own life and the life of her unborn child. She has nothing. She is nothing. And yet, her plight does not go unseen. He calls her by name and by her role in life so far. Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? The voice, the messenger of the Lord Yahweh, knows her and calls out to her. She is seen. She only answers half the question. I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Perhaps she doesn't have a clue as to where she is going. She seems to be headed back to Egypt, the last place she called home. She had likely been given over, given over to Abram and Sarah when they traveled through Egypt many years prior when they had first left out on their own, leaving their homeland, following God's invitation. They lived in Egypt for a time as aliens. And there, Abram and Sarai developed a complicated relationship with the Pharaoh. And upon their departure, left with many riches, including many servants. But... Hagar's direction doesn't seem to matter anyway. The messenger of the Lord instructs her to turn around and to head back to Sarai and to become again to her a servant. But in this command, she is also given a promise. The God who sees her, who knows her, is making a promise to bless her. She'll be protected. She will give birth to a son, and he will inherit not Abraham's promise, but her promise. He will be his own man, a force to be reckoned with. As we look at it, though, it's difficult for us to see the Lord's proclamation as a blessing, that he will be a wild ass of a man, his hand against everyone living at odds with his kin. To us, this sounds not like a blessing, but a curse. And admittedly, scholars concede that the Hebrew language used here is difficult to translate. There's some ambiguity. And it may not indicate hostility, but it perhaps could indicate cooperation. The Hebrew literally reads... His hand in all and the hand of all in his. And he will dwell before all his brothers. It's been the choice of many translators to interpret the words to mean against and the phrase before to mean in hostility toward. But this this proclamation, this blessing, it could easily indicate living a life of partnership in the midst of in the middle of his brothers. We also should take a cue by looking at Hagar's response. She doesn't seem to indicate that the messenger's words are negative, and neither does history. And we'll see in next week's scripture from Genesis chapter 21 how God continues to watch over Ishmael and work out blessings for him and his descendants. Before Hagar, the servant of Sarai, returns to her master, she herself pronounces a blessing. She speaks not to an angel, not to some unidentified messenger, but to God directly. She says, you are El Roy, meaning the God who sees me lives. And she asks, have I really 
seen God and remained alive after seeing Him? And with this, Hagar takes a special place in history. She is the only one who will take it upon themselves to give God a name. Abram addresses God as Adonai, the Lord. It's a title, not so much a name. The narrator refers to God as Yahweh or Jehovah, which also means Lord. Perhaps Hagar is unfamiliar with Abraham's God, or maybe those names seem inadequate to her. She has spent her life in the house of Abram and Sarai, her masters, her lords. And they've seen her only as their servant, an object to direct and control. They've seen her as a thing to use as they may. Servant one day, wife another, a rival to be discarded the next. But the Lord, the Lord sees her differently. Where have you come from, Hagar? And where are you going? These are questions from someone who cares. I will greatly multiply your offspring. They will be a multitude. And your son, name him Ishmael, which means I, your God, hears. I hear you. I see you. I care for you. I will bless you. In the coming chapters, God will become more specific with God's promises to Abram and Sarai. God's covenant relationship will be developed through Sarah's child, Isaac. Isaac is the child of the promise through whom the world will be blessed. And at the right time in history, in the fullness of God's salvation plan, Jesus Christ, a child of Isaac, a child of Abraham, the fulfillment of God's promise will indeed Bless the world. But there is a powerful truth here that must be acknowledged. The God who makes promises to Abraham, to Sarah, and to Isaac is the same God who makes promises to Hagar and to Ishmael. They're different promises, yes, but promises nevertheless. God has not exclusively committed himself to Abraham and Sarah. God's concern is not confined to this one elect line. We see that there is passion and concern for this troubled one, and perhaps all the troubled ones who stand outside that line. We spend a lot of time and energy and emotion, putting people in little boxes, who's in and who's out. And isn't it always the case that we put ourselves in the in category? We think we have all the answers. Yet here in this scripture and throughout the Bible, we encounter a God who works beyond the simple definitions of in and out, chosen, ignored, superior and inferior. You think blessed is an exclusive status? Then we might not be familiar with the radical, inclusive nature of God's grace. For just when we've think we've figured it all out. How God is dispositioned towards someone or some people and that we might be more favorably dispositioned than someone else. Then we've put ourselves in the scandalous position 
of the proprietor and grantor of God's grace. Let us be reminded how God's grace doesn't need our granting, doesn't require our approval, doesn't rely on our permission. Remember, God's grace isn't about us, and that is a good thing for which one of us would deserve God's grace if it was. And for those who have been cast out, unseen by the powers of this world, who know the pain of objectification, who might only know where they've been and not where they're going, you are seen. You are heard. Our God, who Hagar, the blessed mother of Ishmael, called El Roi, is the God who sees, the God who hears, the God who cares. Cast off your burdens, lift up your voice, cry out and know. Know that you are someone special to God. Draw near to God and be blessed as God draws near to you. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.